Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Advanced Funeral Planning with Kelly Owens this morning. My name is Kristen Mertz, and I'm the Communications and Engagement Specialist here at ElderWorks Educational Services. Just a reminder that this is going to be recorded and posted to our Facebook and our YouTube, as well as our website post-presentation. ElderWorks is a not-for-profit 501c3 organization, and our mission is to provide seniors and their families with information, referrals, and guidance for senior living, home care, and support services to help make appropriate decisions. The guidance we provide helps seniors stay home well or transition successfully into a new senior living opportunity. We provide education on a variety of aging topics for consumers and professionals who work with seniors. Um, just a quick reminder to please add any questions that you have into the chat and we will get to them at the end of the presentation. And with that, I will go ahead and turn it over to Kelly. Um, thank you guys for all being here this morning. Thank you, Kristen. Again, hi, welcome everyone. Um, I know this is a um, an interesting topic to talk about and a difficult topic to talk about, but um, nonetheless, very important. So I appreciate um, your being part of this conversation today. Um, as Kristen mentioned, um, we will have some time at the end of the presentation to um, ask any questions and you know go over some of your thoughts. Um, but I do ask that you um, write those down and, and or chat them in, um, whichever you're most comfortable with, and then we'll get to those at the end of the of the presentation. So again, my name is Kelly Owens. I am a pre-arrangement pre -arrangement specialist with a company called Funeral Directors Life, which just simply means that I am able and work with a number of different funeral homes, in this case, both in Lake and Cook County, um, as well as into the Wisconsin market as well. So I've been doing this type of work for over 16 years and absolutely love, love what I do. So um, we will cover today just some of the general concepts and practices of uh, prearrangements and how they differ, how they benefit um, you in regards to comparing to leaving these plans for your family to do um, versus taking care of them as a family yourself. So <clears throat> what kind of got us all here today is a number of statistics that I'd like to quickly share. And that is that every 11 seconds in the United States, a person passes away. And 75% of the time, that person is over the age of 65 and or unprepared for that death. And 40% of the time, that that uh, death occurred suddenly and unexpectedly. So literally here today and gone tomorrow, um, that one-to-one -one ratio that you're seeing, that is the death, the death ratio, meaning it's not if you're going to pass away, but rather when you're going to pass away that we're, pre you know, we're preparing for. And what got me here is that um, when my parents, back in like 2004, 2005, um, my parents lived with my family and I, and my mom had dementia and had been pretty deep into the dementia at that time. And so um, it was recommended to my dad and I um, that we go and we pre-plan mom's funeral. And I remember thinking how morbid that might seem. Um, I thought it was an absolutely ridiculous concept, um, but we did it because um, the social services um, department um, you know, had said that it was really something important to do to pre-plan and prepay mom's funeral in the event that she ended up in a nursing home or on Medicaid. So my dad and I went into our local funeral home in Wisconsin, and we pre-planned mom's funeral. Five and a half months later, after we pre-planned mom, my father died of a massive heart attack, um, literally hitting every one of those statistics, and we did not have a plan. Now, I'm the youngest of eight children, so all eight of us, when you don't have a plan, um, a pre-plan in place, have to go into a funeral home and they start, they, the funeral directors, start asking a ton of questions. And we had to go through that for my dad, um, me and my seven siblings. So the information that is started to ask is information called vital statistics. That is the information that goes onto a death certificate. So that is like legal names, um, places of birth, dates of birth, social security number, uh, the parents' names. So my dad's my dad's um, parents' names um, in this case, 
um, all of the information that, as I said, goes onto a death certificate, educational level, um, occupation, things that have to be accurate and uh, complete, otherwise it holds up the death certificate. Family information is the next section that you have to provide as a family either pri prior to death or at the time of death. Um, as I said, I have a very large family. So we had those are things like who are my dad's children and are they married? What are their spouse's name? Grandchildren, uh, great grandchildren, nieces, nephews, siblings, if you know you're lucky enough to have to have siblings. So that information again um, can be gathered ahead of death or at the time of death. In our case for my dad, we did it at the time of death, even though we had done it prior to death for my mom. Um, the historical data information that a, that a funeral home needs is like uh, educational track. It's the work history. It is hobbies and interests. I like to call this the, the life paragraph um, of an obituary. Um, when you are asking your family or asked yourself to do this at the time of death, I don't know if any of you, usually I would have a show of hands, that if you had been through planning for a loved one's death at the time of a death and while experiencing what I refer to as funeral fog, it is a, it's just a, it's not a medical condition definite, you know, as diagnosed by definition, but is definitely very real. I felt this when I was planning with my siblings, my dad's funeral. I couldn't remember his social security number. Couldn't remember date of birth. There was things that I knew about him the day before because he was alive and well. But when he passed away so suddenly, I just simply couldn't recall. Um, so funeral fog is a condition that exists when you just simply can't function the same way you would because you're going through the grief process. So after you get all of that funeral information and family information gathered, then the funeral home is going to start asking you what type of funeral service you would like to have. So it's like a traditional service means a casketed viewing, a casketed burial or encryptment into a crypt. Um, that is called traditional still because for a century or more um, in our country, um, traditional services have been um, have included casket and casket burial. We are now kind of migrating towards um, the cremation side of things. In our area, we're probably at about 60% of cremation, um, which is you know, a, a very high amount. When I got in the industry 17 years ago, it was probably 30% at most. So it's definitely trending upwards. Um, the other type of funeral service related to cremation is called a cremation memorial service. So that means that the cremation has taken place and you're, in, you're still having the visitation, you're still having a prayer service, you may or may not have a cemetery involved, but there is no traditional viewing. The third um, category or, or service option that you may want to consider is a traditional viewing followed by cremation. I, I refer to that as the compromise plan meaning that it blends the traditional aspects of a funeral, but also allows you as a, a family member to select cremation as the final disposition, it's called. Um, that again is with a rented casket viewing. Um, most funeral homes have that option where you rent a casket, you have the traditional viewing um, with your prayer service, and then cremation takes place. And again, that cremation, the cremated remains may stay at home. Um, they may be scattered. They may, they, there's a couple, there's a lot of act actually options for cremation, uh, cremated remains now um, that are getting uh, more popular. And the, the fourth option that most families consider um, as being an option is what we call graveside services. Now that means that you haven't had a visitation, you haven't necessarily had a prayer service either in a church or at the funeral home, um, but you're going to gather at the graveside to witness and and have a service at, at the cemetery. Now that became very, very popular under COVID. Um, it hasn't kind of gone away from that when we didn't have those you know opportunities then we had to gather at the graveside, but now that restrictions are, are lifted, 
uh, we can go through all of these other service options as well. Once you've decided what type of service you're having, then you have to pick the location and, and whether or not it's going to be over one or two days. Is there a cemetery involved? And if so, how much of that have, have you already taken care of? Um, the, you know, as you're doing this at the time of death, you're not only now having to pick the services, but the merchandise involved in those services. And in our case, now my, my parents were very traditional, so we did have to pick caskets. And when it came to selecting the casket itself, there was eight of us in the room and there was eight opinions. And so when our funeral director asked us if we wanted a metal casket or a wood casket, you know, it's, you know, half of us said wood and half of us said metal. And so we had to look at, you know, like in, on the wood side of things, we had to look at mahogany and cherry and oak and pine and, you know, just regular hardwood. And then we had to look at the 20 gauge and the 18 gauge steels and the stainless steels and pick a color, blue, white, pink, you know, uh, silver. There's just so many choices that you're needing to make with every decision that you're making as a family. Um, there's also another third section of a funeral um, service, and those are called cash advance items that the funeral director will also help you, um, you know, kind of walk through and make selections from. Those are like, is there going to be an obituary notice, a notice in a newspaper? Is it going to be just on a website at the, at the funeral home? Is it going to include a cemetery? And again, do we need to include those costs in the funeral in the funeral plan? Are you going to have a flower budget? Are you going to have church fees? Are you going to have a luncheon or some type of repass? Um, you know, what is it that you as a family desire to have? When you make these decisions or require your family to make these decisions at the time of your death and haven't done it yourself, now they're making what we refer to as irreversible decision after decision. Because once the service has been has taken place, there is no go backs. Okay. Where when you do this ahead of time, you can reverse your decisions, you can make your changes as long as you're living. Then I always say, let's get back together every two, three years, or however often you desire. If your wishes change, and we will update your wishes. So that's one of the biggest. Um, benefits of doing things ahead of time yourself. Not only can you do it as a family with you present, but also you can make your decision. You can make a decision to start with, and then you can change your mind as long as, as I said, as, as long as you're living. So that is really, there's no nothing irreversible about a pre-planned funeral. The um, other thing that I typically want to point out is when you are expecting your family or requiring your family to take care of this decisions or all of this issue of planning your funeral, it's often on the worst day of their life. So they've just lost you as a loved one. And now not only are they going to have to come up with all of the statistical data and family information and make all the decisions for you, but it's also the worst day of their lives. I refer to this as complete chaos because you are, this is what the brain looks like when they're going through their grief is this complete chaos chart. When in fact, you could have done it yourself and saved them from just looking, they have to review your, your um, plan at the time of your death they know that you've already prepaid for it. So that burden isn't on them. So they come in and they review your plan and then they choose the date and times of services. That's the loving step to take care of. That's the difference between doing it ahead of time and expecting your family um, to do it at the time of death. They would have to go through all this complete chaos where you and I would walk through all of those things, not in a chaotic manner, but rather in a very calm and collected manner so that at the time of the death, they're choosing just the date and time. And if you are thinking, and I'm sure many of you are, of having cremation, you might be thinking to yourself, well, Kelly, exactly. I don't want my family to go through this chaos, so I'm just going to be cremated. Well, 
cremation, there are a number of laws that have to take place, um, a number of things that that have to be authorizations that have to be given, permits that have to be received when cremation is your disposition of choice. So it is even more important. You still have all these decisions to make. Your family still has all of these options available to them, even if you're being cremated. But if at the time of your passing, somebody in your the direct lineage in your family does not want you to be cremated and will not give that permission by law, unfortunately, we then cannot cremate. So during the um, prearrangement process, you and I will identify who it is by law that has to give those authorizations. And then we kind of touch base with them to make sure that they don't have any um, difficulty with cremation or they're not opposed to cremation so that we don't have any surprises at death. So you and I will figure out who that is together lawfully, and then we will take care of all of the paperwork pre-death. So again, there is no surprises at death. Okay. So cremation doesn't take you off the hook. It puts you on a bigger one actually. Okay. I have developed um, what I call an interactive personalized prearrangement kit. That is not what you received via email. The um, interactive personalized prearrangement kit has a number of things that I'll refer to here in a few minutes on the ask me about section uh, flyer that I sent via email. Um, that is things that it just, it's interactive because it's you and I sitting down and having a conversation. And it's personalized because each and every one of you, each and every one of us has a different plan. So um, it is personalized in the sense that it documents all of your vital records, all of your family information and all of your wishes. So that is a very personal decision and therefore it is everything is personalized for you in this kit. It is a free service. Now I do put in home or at the funeral home here. Um, those are options. Um, we can also do that first visit virtually or by phone, however you wish to meet. Um, I haven't asked Kristen this, but um, I, you know, I would suspect that perhaps we could even meet at Elderworks if if that was a, a you know a place where you would want to meet um, to go over and have your com your conversations. Um, it is comprehensive. Um, when we get to the handout section of you know, going through this, you'll see what type of topics that we cover. And it is just, it, it is totally comprehensive with you know, the 17 years of experience. Um, what my goal is, is to create what we call a healing funeral. So we wanna make sure that when your service has taken place, that your family one identifies that it was for you and about you, but for them to move on through their grief process, we want to make sure that it combined your wishes with the needs of your family and that the prearrangement process, as well as them leaving after the type after your service, has given everybody the peace of mind that um, comes with, with prearrangements and a well thought out funeral. So I talked a little bit about my dad and my mom um, living with us for so many years because of her dementia. And so when my father died so suddenly, um, I had to contact the Alzheimer's Association and ask them what portions of the service she should attend. And so they asked me a little bit about my mom and my dad. My mom met my dad when she was 14. Uh, she gave up a full ride scholarship to Juilliard to marry my dad. Um, and I only tell you that because that became a very important part of my dad's and my mom's story when my dad passed away. Um, so I had worked with the Alzheimer's Association like I had I had spoken about. And so they recommended that I take my mom to the actual funeral service itself. And so I did. And my mom had not been articulate for years. She didn't know me. She did know my dad. Um, but she certainly hasn't sung for ages, but yet when we, um, had my dad's service, I wheeled her up to the altar so that she could hear him, um, that she could hear the vocalist sing the Lord's prayer. And to our amazement, 
um, my mom sang every word um, of that song to my dad. And so that became our story. That became our healing experience in our family um, through the tears, through the goosebumps, through all of that. It became very clear that every element of a funeral, even with a woman with Alzheimer's who could not articulate, could not understand necessarily what was going on throughout the process, did turn to me. Not only had she sung to my dad, but she also turned to me and said, I don't know why my eyes are crying. So that sparked me into always, I always say, I'm going to find what's important to your family so that they remember and talk about your service year after year after year, because that's part of grief and that's part of healing. So um, I always say, when we sit together, we're going to find your Lord's prayer. What is it that your family needs to hear, needs to see, or needs to be part of your service to make sure they know that you're they're celebrating your life? And then I typically say, you know, just to step back from funerals for, for a few minutes and imagine that you have a daughter and imagine maybe it's a niece, it's a it's a daughter, it's a son, it's whomever. And they call you and they say, mom, dad, you know, I'm finally getting married. I'm, I'm, you know, Jody finally proposed and you're hearing about the proposal. And she goes on to say, you know, mom, dad, I'd like you to plan my wedding. I'd like you to pick the venue and invite the guests. I'd like you to, you know, select my, find my dress and pick out the food and send out invitations and and mom and dad, I'd love you to pay pay for my wedding. And then you're thinking, okay, well, this joyous occasion just became a little bit more problematic. And then she continues to say, and I'd like to, we're going to get married in three days. Now, I don't know how many of you smiled or how many of you chuckled about that, thinking about how unreasonable that was, is to plan a wedding and expect payment and do all of that within a three day period of time. And we all think that that's unreasonable, but yet when we look and compare the planning of a funeral to the planning of a wedding, there is very many parallels. And yet when we don't take advantage of planning it ahead of time and, and you know, having a free service with a funeral planner instead of a wedding planner to help you through the process, then oftentimes that's exactly what we're asking our family to do. And that is to plan our funeral, pay for our funeral, and take care of all of this while grieving in a three-day period of time. So if you smiled, if you laughed, if you think that planning a wedding is, is irrational in a three-day period, then pre-planning your own funeral service should be a no become a no-brainer because that's just as irrational but un under grief instead of under a celebration. So the choice is really yours. You have two options. You can either wait and not do anything for, you know, yourself and ask your family to do it at the time of need um, while under grief, while experiencing the worst day of their life, while having funeral fog, making irreversible decisions, or you can um, set up a conversation with me and do it on a prearrangement basis, okay? And in order to decide which way of those two choices you're going to choose that make sense for you, you have to kind of reflect on three questions. First of all, what type of plan do you have in place? Is it little yellow sticky notes everywhere? Is it like a little binder that you've written down some things? Have you verbally talked about it with your family? Um, you know, what is it that you've already done? Have you done the cemetery piece, but not the funeral piece? So what plan do you currently have in place and how do we make that complete? And does it matter to you? So does it matter to you to take care of this for yourself, to not burden this with your family or you know, burden your family with this? And then if so, if it does matter, what is your next step? I've, I've kind of put this information up here, but it is on the other handouts as well. But you might want to write down, this is my email. And this is my business cell phone. I do live in Wisconsin. So that's why the, the 262. So thank you, Kristen, for inviting me to speak. Um, oh, I really you. do hope that it was helpful for everyone and uh, encourage you guys to take the next step. Okay.